Grigory Rasputin is a mythical person in Russian history whose life and demise are shrouded in mystery. Rasputin was a sexual outlaw, spiritual healer, political assassin, and renegade monk who was both despised and admired throughout his lifetime. He also served as a convenient scapegoat for several dissident groups. In this video, we'll explain these life events and the puzzling demise of the fabled Siberian holy man. The full name of Grigory Rasputin is Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin, and he was born in Pokrovskoy, near Tumen, Siberia, during the Russian Empire. The surname Rasputin, which means debauched one in Russian, was given to Grigory because of his reputation for decadence, even though he was educated. He made a religious conversion when he was 18 years old and eventually went to the monastery in Verkocher, where he joined the Klisti sect. Rasputin distorted Klisti's doctrine into the idea that one was closest to God when feeling holy passionlessness, and that the best way to achieve this condition was through the sexual fatigue that followed extended misconduct. After returning to Pokrovskoy, he married Praskovia Fyodorovna Dubrovina at 19, and the couple had four children together afterward. Rasputin was not reconciled through marriage, and later ran away from home to Greece and then Jerusalem, subsisting on the donations of the peasants and earning a reputation as a steritz, which means a self-declared holy man who could cure the ill and foretell the future. Rasputin's wanderings brought him to St. Petersburg in 1903, where he was greeted by Hermogen, the Bishop of Saratov, and Theophan, the inspector of the religious institution of St. Petersburg. Rasputin was warmly welcomed since the royal circles of St. Petersburg enjoyed immersing themselves in mysticism and the occult. At that time, he was known as an untidy wanderer with sparkling eyes and miraculous healing abilities. Rasputin was acquainted with the royal family in 1905, and he was called to Nicholas in Alexandra's palace in 1908 after a bleeding crisis involving their hemophiliac son. After alleviating the boy's suffering, likely through his hypnotic abilities, Rasputin warned the boy's parents that the fate of the kid and the dynasty were inextricably linked to him. Was this the truth? Was Rasputin really seeing into the future? Or was it just a lie Rasputin made of at that moment? No one knows for sure. However, this warning launched a decade during which Rasputin significantly impacted the royal household and governmental affairs. Rasputin always stood in the stance of a humble and pure peasant before the royal family. Outside of court, however, he quickly reverted to his previous licentious behaviors. He attracted mistresses and made many additional attempts to seduce women while preaching that having physical touch with him had a purifying and curing effect. When Nicholas heard about Rasputin, he failed to admit that he was anything but a holy man and believed that those accusing him were jealous since they were dismissed from their positions of power. Rasputin attained the height of his influence at the Russian court. In September 1915, when World War I was still in progress, Nicholas II took command of his soldiers personally. He left for the front lines, leaving Alexandra in charge of domestic affairs while Rasputin was her counselor. Rasputin's power extended from the choice of cabinet ministers to the appointment of religious authorities, and on occasion, he interfered in military affairs, leading to Russia's damage. Rasputin was a fierce foe of anyone who opposed the autocracy or himself. There were numerous attempts to kill Rasputin and prevent other disasters for Russia. Iliator, a clergyman, was one of several individuals attempting to establish a dispute between Rasputin and the royal family. He was expelled from St. Petersburg and stripped of his priestly ordination due to his actions. A few years later, Rasputin was stabbed in the stomach by one of Iliotor's followers, who had waited outside of Rasputin's house. It appeared Rasputin might pass away, but again call, there was a miracle. Rasputin fully recovered, to everyone's surprise. Due to her insanity, the assassin was declared not accountable for her crimes, and in the meantime, Iliotor left the country. Another party of nobles led by Prince Felix Yusupov and the right-wing politician Vladimir Purishkevich came to the same conclusion that Rasputin's influence threatened the Russian Empire. Therefore, his assassination was plotted again. But how would this turn out? Well, just like before. Grigory was welcomed to his palace by Prince Felix, who served him cyanide-laced tea and cakes. After rejecting them once, Rasputin eventually ate the poison cakes but appeared all right. He was given three glasses of poisoned wine when he requested some wine, yet he seemed unaffected. Frustrated by all this, Felix decided to walk upstairs to his partners and get a gun, with which he shot Rasputin in the chest. Once the murder had been carried out, or at least that's what Felix thought, one of Felix's accomplices assumed the identity of Rasputin 
and was driven home by Felix to establish an alibi. Meanwhile, Rasputin being still alive, lay in the same basement where he was supposedly murdered. As soon as Felix returned, Rasputin jumped up and attacked him. But before he could do anything, another conspirator fired at Rasputin three times. One bullet even managed to hit Grigory in the forehead at close range. Rasputin, again presumed to be dead, was thus driven to the neighboring Petrovsky Bridge, where he was tossed into the icy Neva River after collapsing into a snowbank and being covered in linen. Yet again, Rasputin was dropped into the river while still alive. This was later discovered by the post-mortem results, which indicated that he did not die of the bullets. He had actually drowned. True or not, but this is the most famous account of Grigory's murder, published by Yusupov in his book, released around 1928. Although not alive today, Rasputin is still notorious. He was no doubt a mysterious man with a thick beard who blended in with influential people and was thought to possess an odd hypnotic influence over them. He was also nearly impossible to kill using conventional methods. It may also come as a shock to you now that the actual assassination of Rasputin was probably much different than what we have just discussed. Although we cannot judge which story is correct, his daughter Maria, who left Russia after the revolution and went on to become a circus lion trainer under the moniker, the daughter of the famous Mad Monk, whose feats in Russia astonished the world, published a book of her own in 1929 that criticized Yusupov's actions and called into question the reliability of his account. She claimed that her father would never have consumed a plate of cakes because he detested sweets. Furthermore, the autopsy results only indicate that he was shot straight in the head, but did not mention the poisoning or drowning. Thus, Maria is of the view that to promote his books and enhance his image, Yusupov turned murder into a great conflict between good and evil. However, contrary to what was expected, Rasputin's assassination did not result in a significant shift in Nicholas and Alexandra's policies. This was much to the dismay of Yusupov and his accomplices, who desired quite the opposite. However, because Rasputin symbolized the imperial court's corruption, his assassination was correctly interpreted as an effort by the aristocrats to maintain their hold on power at the continuous expense of the proletariat. Moreover, Rasputin's murky reputation was reflected in the public's varied reactions. When the killers emerged in public, the elite delighted and cheered them. On the other hand, Rasputin was mourned as one of their own by the peasantry, who saw in his death as another illustration of the nobility's stranglehold over the Tsar. They believed that whenever a peasant gained power under the Tsar, wealthy individuals would assassinate him. This brings us to the end of this video. If you liked the video, please consider subscribing and sharing so we can keep bringing more content like this. Also, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. See you next time.